I've been thinking a lot lately about Brother Wilson, retired Methodist preacher who I knew back in the old days in Alabama. And the last time I recorded a story uh, about him, I talked about how at 80 years old, he came to the annual meeting, the annual conference of the Methodist Church in Alabama, West Florida, and asked for money to start a new church down in the Wiregrass, uh, down where the Army had established a camp. And he knew enough to know that that was going to be a populated area, that the Army was moving in, and, and he was right because a few years later, Camp Rucker began Fort Rucker. And he knew there needed to be a church there. So at 80 years old, he comes to the annual conference and asks for money from the committee that was responsible for that. And they turned him down. And I told about how he went to the floor of annual conference and appealed to the delegation and overrode the committee and got his money. Well, there's a part of that story that I have yet to tell, and that's how he got property for the church. Now, Brother Wilson, this was in 1950, probably 56, um, and a couple of years after that, and he didn't have the benefit of all the demographic studies and, and what the population would be like in, in the uh, census data and all of that. He just knew that that was going to be a place that needed to have a church. And there weren't enough ministers, active pastors to go around. And so he just took it on himself. Well, he had his eye on a piece of property that um, he thought would be ideal for the church. It was owned by a couple of old maid sisters who lived in the community. And he had approached them on more than one occasion trying to get them to sell. Well, they they just kind of hemmed and hawed and and um, they they didn't know about that. So one morning, uh, it was actually, it was a little after midnight, uh, Brother Wilson got up, dressed, and went down and knocked on the door of the house where the sisters lived. But Margaret came to the door and she said, Brother Wilson, what are you doing here? What's wrong? And Brother Wilson said, Well, I've been talking to the Lord. And the Lord told me to come down here and tell you too that you need to give that property to the church. You know it's the right thing to do and you can afford it. And I think it's time you did it. Well, while he was talking, uh, Bernice, the other sister, woke up and said, Margaret, what's going on? And Margaret says, well, it's Brother Wilson. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's okay. Well, what, what's he doing here? He said he'd been talking to the Lord, and the Lord told him to come down and tell us to give that property to the church. And Bernice said, well, I guess if that's what the Lord wants us to do, we better do it. And Brother Wilson got the property for the church. That was the power that he had. Everybody who knew him knew that when he said he'd been talking to the Lord, he meant it. And I must admit, I've always been suspicious of um, uh, people who talk about speaking for the Lord, except Brother Wilson. And uh, I kind of believe the way those two sisters did. Well, he got his property, and the uh, and they started the, the church. Annual conference was always a, a, a interesting. It was a great time for me, as a young pastor. Uh, and the pro the schedule was always the same. This is when all the pastors and the lay delegates from all the churches came together to do the business of the church and to make appointments, decide 
what what pastors were going to what churches for another year. And schedule was always the same. We'd meet on uh, uh, Thursday, Thursday afternoon, and we'd have a worship service. We'd sing a lot of the old hymns and Methodists in those days, clergy and lay people alike, loved to sing. And we'd have a stirring worship service and then we'd start the business of the church. Now the business was it was pretty active, pretty lively because we had a, a very conservative uh, group of clergy and, and laity in the, in the church that, that thought their role was to preserve the status quo, that no matter what. But we also had a, a smaller group of um, especially uh, clergy who knew that, uh, I remember this is the 1950s, who knew that uh, the status quo needed to be challenged. And one of the big issues, of course, was race. We had racial segregation and, and there were some of us that, uh, that knew the church needed to take the lead and, and speak out against what was a, uh, an immoral and unjust a treatment of our African-American sisters and brothers. So we always, the business sessions were always um, lively. And then the appointments, uh, uh, we do the business on Thursday and Friday and wrap it up on Saturday morning and the bishop and his cabinet, the district superintendents, would have met and then at three o'clock Saturday afternoon they would read the appointments. And that's where we as pastors would find out if we were going back to the church we'd been serving or if we were going to move to another. Uh, and then it, uh, the meeting would adjourn with prayer and we'd go back to our local church. And Sunday morning, if we were going to stay there another year, we would announce to the congregation uh, and business would go on as usual. And if we were going to move, we would also make that announcement. And then on Thursday of the following week, we packed up and moved. That was the way it was done. And I think for the most part, it worked pretty well. It would never work today, not in our society. But it did then. But one of the great things about annual conference for me was the time we had outside of the business sessions and outside of talking about our appointments. When we just bring each other up to speed and, and share stories and tell what was going on because we, we covered the largest part of Alabama and, and the panhandle of Florida. And I remember one particular occasion when we were, the 10 or 12 of us, sitting around under a in the shade of an oak tree and, and telling stories. And Brother Wilson was holding forth. He was a fantastic storyteller. I have to say that most of my stories about Brother Wilson, he didn't tell on himself. He was too, much, too modest, too much of a humble person. But he had great stories. And he was holding forth. And, and uh, a man about, about his age walked by one of the lay delegates and uh, stopped and looked and he said, um, uh, Brother Wilson? And uh, Wilson said, um, yeah. And he said, uh, uh, he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Ted Dawson. Uh, I'm from Graceful. And Brother Wilson said, oh, I know Graceful. He said, that's one of the first churches I served. And uh, Mr. Dawson said, I know. I was a member of your congregation. It was back in the 1920s. And uh, he said, Brother Wilson, do you remember the time that you, uh, or somebody tried to get you to join the Q Klux Klan? Brother Wilson said, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, everybody in our little group perked up. Brother Wilson was the least likely person to ever join a Ku Klux Klan. 
he was not one of the conservative pastors. And somebody said, tell us about that. What, what's the story? Yeah, Brother Wilson said, well, he said, I was just trying to get acquainted to my lay people, and one of the men came up and said, uh, Brother Wilson said, we've got a, uh, it's a, a group, a club, kind of, it's a secret organization, and uh, we're meeting tonight. We wondered if you'd like to come along and maybe join. And Wilson said, well, I figured, yeah, it'd give me a chance to get acquainted with uh, the congregation and some of the men. and uh, So I, I went. Well, he said, when I got there, I noticed that there were uh, a couple of people had on uh, white robes, and I thought this was part, part of an initiation process. And, and the uh, man who had invited me said, now, what we're going to do is we're going to put you out in the middle of the room and we're going to blindfold you. And uh, we'll explain a little bit about the process and then uh, we'll initiate you. Brother Wynn said, well, that's, that's okay. So he got him a chair and they sat out, he sat out in the middle and, and he said, uh, now they blindfolded me. He said, they started off with prayer. I thought that was kind of, that was nice. And then they started reading some scripture. Uh, a couple of scriptures I read were kind of odd, but uh, then they started talking about the racial problem. And uh, I, I got uneasy. I didn't like the way this was going. And then at one point I realized this is, this is a Ku Klux Klan. They're going to try to take me in as a member. And somebody said, but well, what'd you do? And Mr. Dawson said, I can, he interrupted, and he said, I can tell you what he did. He said, when he realized this was the Klan, he reached up and took the blindfold off. And of course, when he did, he saw everybody in the room because we didn't have our hoods on. And he recognized a lot of the members of, of the church. And he said, Gentlemen, I have to tell you, what you're doing is not only illegal, it's immoral, and it violates the law and the love of God, and you'll burn in hell for it. Got up and walked out of the, of the room. And those of us who knew Brother Wilson knew that was a good story, a true story. And Brother Wilson said, yep, I remember that, but I never said any more about the Klan or anything else, and nobody ever asked me to join. And Mr. Dawson said, Brother Wilson, do you know what happened after that? No, I don't. I, I, didn't, I wasn't going to take it any further. And Dawson said, well, I can tell you now that the Ku Klux Klan never met in Graceville after that night. That was Brother Wilson. Genuinely pious. Talked to the Lord. I've said before many times, I'm suspicious of people who Say the Lord talks to them. But in Brother Wilson's case, I know it's true. Not terribly um, reluctant. Totally like it, it was. And it's because of men like Brother Wilson that have kept my inspiration and my hope up through the years. Brother Hugh Emmett Wilson, Sr., but known by everybody as Brother Wilson. <laughs>
Thank you for listening. And I hope you resonate with his life half as much as I.